on a variety of issues in UB, including cultural appropriation, music economics, piracy, and aesthetics. His interests are, include American music, and he's an active performer of a, in a barbershop quartet music. I know that's certainly quite popular in, in Canada and probably here in the U.S. too. And also an American experimental composer, which is uh, performed in various places around the U.S., including MGM, Grand Casino, Carnegie Hall, Wildwood, New Jersey, and Convention Center. And our second speaker this morning is Valerie Carter, as Shane beside me here. Valerie is a research associate with the Bureau of Labor Education at the University of Maine. Uh, she's a sociologist, and her, her background is quite active in environmental movements, environmental activists. So you've got the, uh, the titles of the talks in your program. So without further ado, I'll ask. I think the East presenter is going to go about 15 minutes or so. I think 20? you said 20. Or, or 20? Okay, okay. we'll go we'll have up to 20 minutes for a presentation. Okay. Whoa, whoa, and whoa. You don't have to do 20, though. Oh. You don't see that much anymore, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's snow oh, projectors. You see just everything. everything. <laughs> whoa. Oh, you lost your, uh, your power brief. Uh, and did somebody get the bump for us? No, I think it just... Uh, Found. Okay. Okay. We made it, people. Okay. So without further ado, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give the, I'll give both of you some uh, signals when you get down to about five minutes, and uh, I'll ask uh, Jude to lead off. Great. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jude Thomas, and thanks for being out here at eight in the morning on a Sunday. When I got the schedule and saw that I had this slot, I was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> and I uh, told my friend. So they put me at 8 in the morning, my friend Steve, who's a, a big bass, and he just said, somebody has to speak at that time. <laughs> so uh, my, my presentation is called Vanishing Scarcity, Basic Income as a Means to Preserve Value in the Arts, and I was interested to be the only sort of artist speaking at the convention, and I was surprised not to be the only person from the humanities, and also delighted not to be the only person who did the vague title, colon, this is what this presentation is about. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this morning, and I'd like to also put an acknowledgement to a colleague of mine, Derek Jepson, who is very helpful in forming some of these ideas and supporting me through the process of this. This idea came to fruition or popped in my head when I was working on an article dealing with piracy of content online and copyright issues. And this is a sort of a really raging debate that comes up. And everyone talks about, oh, they're just stealing the work of artists, they're stealing the work of this. But the thing that never comes up in this debate is that there is technology out there right now that makes any, all this content, you distribute it for free, and anyone can make perfect copies as much as possible. Barely anyone brings that up. It's this enormous elephant in the room that no one's talking about. And what this, also con th what this also connects with is a narrative that's happening right now. Is like, now is a better time for artists to be free and do whatever they want more than anything else. And while that's true, because production costs have dropped dramatically in the last 20 years, whereas uh, Nirvana's album Nevermind, which came out at the beginning of the 90s, something like that would take around a half a million dollars to produce from, from signing the artist to pushing out the CDs into the store. Today, something like that can be done for around $10,000 on the high end, which means someone raising that kind of capital is really, it's, it's doable for something, someone to do. However, this freedom of artists narrative is frankly hogwash, mostly because where do you find the time to make something good? And if you don't have the time to develop your craft and do what you want, all we're going to see is just this continued stream of sort of like mediocrity that's happening there. So kind of I'll start with talking about what art labor has generally looked like through history. And there's been two sort of main sources for what has supported art labor. The first is patronage. And then secondly, freelancing. So Patronage has been the lion's share, and art in Western society, and also in other societies, and I'll apologize if there's going to be a, a bit of a European-American slant to this, because unfortunately this is the, the, the 
swath of the literature and the statistics deal with this. But I will say in my research, I found that what we, what the things that are hallmarks of sophisticated art occurred in China and outside of Europe about a hundred, several hundred years before they started occurring in Europe. And mainly that's state-sponsored schools and things associated with rulers. So if you think about art, it's an expensive endeavor. Take Michelangelo's David, for instance. Someone had to mine a marble quarry, then you had to find the right piece of marble, then you had to get this piece of marble that's about 14 feet high into someone's workshop, and then you had to find the person with the level of skill to actually do something like that. Now with Renaissance technology, the big thing is getting a giant piece of marble that's 14 feet high from a quarry into a shop. So that's going to take a lot of manpower. Much more doable today with technology, but back then incredibly expensive. And then you don't want to waste this rare piece of marble, so you have to find someone who's very good, and you need someone who has dedicated their life to this, which means that person has not been spending a lot of their time farming or cooking or doing these types of things. And, as, and you have to continue to support that person so they can be a good sculptor, and you need wealth to do that. And that has been traditionally what has produced these works of art, is wealth because the immediate results of a work of art are not very useful. It doesn't feed you. It does not clothe you. Maybe you can trade it for that. But a sculpture will not. A sculpture is something you cannot eat. A song is something that you cannot wear to keep you warm at night. And this is still the situation today, despite all the technology, that patrons do exist and uh, they exist in several forms. Um, the first, and so we have modern patronage today, and these take, these have transformed over time. Originally in Europe there was the church, then there was states came in to do this, rulers, after in the 19th century we started to see the rise of the middle class and individuals starting to get involved, and then for-profit institutions like media companies start, started coming into it. Also during the late 18th century and the 19th century, academic institutions such as uh, the Academy in Paris or the Academy, the Academy of Music in Paris and also the Royal Academy in England started to emerge. And then finally, cultural institutions. And these are big in the United States, which are nonprofit things like the New York Met and the New York Philharmonic, which emerged in the latter half of the 19th century. So let's take a look at what each of these people sort of bring to the table and uh, what they do. So media companies, generally for-profit organizations that, you know, television studios, newspaper firms, record companies, uh, because they're for-profit, they're often touted as being innovative and responding to markets and doing these types of things. And while certainly there is some truth to that, they have a little more flexibility in as much as that when they actually decide to do something, they can do it and very quickly without any sort of restraints, meaning that they have a kind of autonomy. It's really good. But we have to remember that these are really money-making enterprises, and they're going to do the thing that makes them the money with the least amount of risk. And that does not really mean innovation in the arts. For every time there's something great like uh, a really amazing movie, um, like Full Metal Jacket or an album by Pink Floyd, we have to remember that we have something like We Built This City so, um, that comes along. And, and there's dozens of these songs, and we just forget them because why would we want to remember them? Um, so when we think about innovation, it doesn't really happen. I mean, this is some of the stuff that we're looking at innovation just in the movie field coming up this year. Mall Cop 2, Hot Tub Time Machine 2, Ted 2, Jurassic World and Furious 7. Now, I'm not quite sure the people who produced Furious 7, were they sitting around a table thinking, like, what, what have we missed? What, oper what artistic opportunity have we missed in the previous six movies for this to happen? They're like, oh, man. This, and all due respect to the actor who died in the car crash last year, but um, seriously, this is about making money. It's not about some narrative. It's like, oh, this, we missed out on this essential truth of humanity, so we need to make Furious 7. Next up, academic institutions. And, of course, these are music schools, art schools embedded in universities. I know we have a lot of 
academics in the room. And these are really great gigs, and it's a really good place to be in. I was in residence at a university for two years when I was doing my master's degree. I had to teach one class, and I could do whatever I wanted. It was really nice. I didn't get paid a lot, a lot but it was doable. And what's great about these is they're not responding for, for, they're not for profit, and you can go into a small, isolated thing and do exactly the research that you want to do. And this is excellent. However, the flaws with academic institutions are the structural nature, which is the, the insular society, which is great, but at the same time, they, while claiming to be innovative, work as sort of a feedback loop in and of themselves to reinforce their own beliefs. Uh, when we select students to come to institutions, we want students that are going to bring things to the table, and there's a prejudice that we want people that's kind of reinforce what we believe. Similarly with faculty, we don't want to bring in people who are just going to shake the system up and break down the like existing structure that's in there. Additionally, academic institutions have voters that they have to justify their existence to. They have legislators that they have to justify their existence to. If you're in a private institution, you have donors that you have to justify your existence to. And this can lead to bad decisions. Right now at University of Massachusetts in Amherst, they have, the engineering school has stopped accepting students from Iran because they're afraid of sanctions. And what, is, what was reported in the Boston Globe is that these, these sanctions, the, universe, the State Department, the U.S. State Department, approves all the candidates ahead of time. So the school doesn't even do this, but they're blanketly taking a policy of just saying, you're from Iran, you can't be in our school, even though they, these people may have a stamp of approval by the State Department. Next, we have cultural institutions, orchestras, operas, museums, etc. Another really good thing is that these are nonprofit and they don't respond well. They don't have to respond to the interests of the marketplace, so to speak. But the problem with this is that these organizations are very large. They're and they've mainly served, especially in the United States, to reinforce Western white male culture and the art that comes out of these cultures. In the, starting in the latter half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, there was a very strong movement to exalt certain forms of art to, and to disparage others as just not being worthy. And this was based largely upon a cultural context and not about the content of the art itself, which is why we sort of carry around this idea that a symphony is going to be better than any other kind of music ever made. A mediocre opera will be better than Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club or a chart by Thelonious Monk, and that's kind of ridiculous. You know, it's, it's endemic in the fact that there is a genre of music in classical music called art songs, as if other songs are not art. This is just... Um, so they've had this very long history of doing this, and it's frankly, racist. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I'll be happy to <laughs> introduce you to much more literature on that subject. So with these three things, what are the, what are the other options that's out there? We've, and the answer really is independent artists. And now is a great time to do that because the technology is here for anybody to take advantage of really going out there and doing what they want. However, the same technology that enables people to do this easily and cheaply is the same technology that allows stuff to be distributed at low cost for free. If you make an album and put it online or just share a CD with your friend, that album can be copied an infinite amount of times with perfect, as a perfect copy. You lose control of the product completely. So this line, it's like, just go out there, do it yourself, sell your product on the market. How do you do that if there's no pressure on supply? The scarcity has gone. Supply is infinite. That is going to drive the price in way, way down, way down. And this gets into the whole piracy debate that comes up, which is loaded with a bunch of things that don't really relate to individual artists. Um, Frankly, the issue is mostly businesses that are using things without permission and without license. And we're seeing a really small sector of, 
of uh, media content being pirated. For instance, uh, in a couple years, um, PricewaterhouseCoopers is estimating the total global media value is going to come to about maybe $2 trillion. And we're looking at, m at most an estimation of about $250 billion worth of piracy. So there's a small segment, and it could be as low as 80, a really small segment. But it's not something to disparage completely. For instance, I want to talk about Alex Wild, who is an insect photographer. That's not Alex Wild. That is a, that is a spider. But this is the sort of beautiful work he does. And uh, the problem is he's a photographer. And he'll put something online, and someone can just grab it by right-clicking it and saving it, and then posting it on their website. And then someone takes that, and someone takes that, and it's almost like this becomes this just huge commonly owned property because there's no trail of, of who owns. It's like people throwing pennies on the street and wondering, like, whose pennies are these when you pick them up? Nobody asked that question. So the thing is, his main problem has not been people just taking, uh, has not been individuals taking these pictures for their own use. The problem is businesses will grab this online and put it on their website. To a certain extent, even a government has taken one of his images and used it on a coin without compensating him. And so the, you can say, like, oh, we'll just pursue these licensing. Go, just sue these people with copyright. But copyright has failed because the, the usual cost for a copyright claim, a small copyright claim of about $3,000, the average cost to pursue that in litigation is $350,000. So really, this is only available to people who have the capital to back it up, which are the large patrons that exist. So this is where basic income comes into the equation. And, uh, and so this is the, uh, what are some of the things it is? We've talked about this for the last few days. Of course, the elimination of basic survival costs. And what this does is it allows someone who's interested in the arts to not worry about how they're going to how they're going to survive, just like every other person who could benefit from this thing, uh, they can take different small jobs to raise capital for their projects without having and have more ability to dictate the terms of those jobs. They can say, "I only want to work 20 hours a week because I got all this other stuff going on, and I just need some money to sort of back my projects here and there." Secondly, the development of craft. Being an artist takes a lot of hard work and a lot of time, not an unreasonable amount. Someone spending two hours a day, five days a week, for five years can improve incredibly with something like this. But those moments of practice have to be very focused, very aware of what they're doing. You can't just keep practicing things in a certain way because you may not really be aware that you're doing something wrong and then you just get worse at it. Finally, and what's really important, is autonomy for artists and consumers of art. With basic income, an artist or a small group of artists can come together in a cooperative and pursue interests that they want to pursue with the freedom to raise capital in different ways to promote their own projects. Additionally, small communities can come together and support individual artists within their communities, especially communities that have been traditionally marginalized. Uh, now, a question for supporting an artist isn't a question of do I pay my rent or do I, or do I buy a painting from this person who's in my community. And it allows them in ways, what's really important is that, like I mentioned, that these communities have been traditionally marginalized and these large patrons, especially media companies, have been sort of saying this is the art we have and this is the art you get to consume. And we don't have a lot of control over that. And as consumers, this is a powerful thing where we can say, no, you know, whatever group doesn't speak for our community. We have these artists that speak for our community, and we can come together and support them in a way that you have never been really able or willing to support them. And now we have the power to do that because we have basic income and they have basic income. And this is really where the power comes in with the arts is ultimately the autonomy question. And so will this actually 
increase the amount of value the art will it make art better than it is that's really difficult to say it's 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 a huge debate obviously what constitutes good art hence we have the phrase there's no accounting for taste but what is nice is that we can have a consumers can be in a position to choose artists can be in a position to choose at the same time and this environment is really good because frankly what we've been given throughout history has not really been great. For every person like Beethoven, we overlook 50 people who just aren't that great. The general rule with patrons has been like, just don't be bad. Don't be bad. You know, don't, don't suck. You know, that's fine. You can, if you're great, then wonderful. You know, Joseph Haydn enjoyed an excellent career as working for a patron throughout his life. But the simple fact is, the person who employed him probably didn't care that much that he was great. He just cared like, eh, his music doesn't suck. That's good enough. And that's generally been the case. So now, like, yeah, we'll still have a bunch of mediocre art. There's going to be a lot of grainy cat videos online, and that's going to continue forever. But what we can do is empower artists to create what they want and empower consumers to consume what they want and we can make our own decisions about what we like and dislike and not have large patrons deciding to just keep feeding us a lot of mediocre things that just we've kind of had to put up with because we just didn't have the wealth to support that. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all having me. That's, that's, that's why basic income is going to be great for you. Okay, thanks, dude. So we'll proceed to Valerie's presentation. Okay. So we need to get yours. Okay. So you want to go to play? This is where the extraterrestrials are going to come from that are going to visit us. Right. But they've all been wiped out by robots. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Remember. Well, howdy, folks. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about union support for a uh, big, for a basic income guarantee, and for a revenue-neutral carbon tax in the United States. And uh, more specifically, I'll be looking really at some of the exploring and asking questions about some of the interconnections between um, the labor movement in the U.S., um, environmental uh, advocates, particularly with trying to limit CO2 emissions and the rule of a basic income policy. So I'm exploring the, those in, interconnections both in terms of, of the policies and ideas themselves and also strategies for potentially building alliances or not, as the case may be. Okay. Um, just some quick personal background. Um, I'm living in Bangor, Maine. I, I teach part-time and occasionally at the University of Maine in labor education, but I primarily do more policy writing kinds of work. I work there half time, and I've, I've been working there in labor education since 1995. I'm not an expert on labor unions. Um, my most of my acquaintance directly with unions has to do with unions in Maine, and we're a, a fairly rural state, so I have not had a lot of experience, for example, in, in working with large, say, urban-based uh, union locals. Okay, um, and I've also been involved off and on in various kinds of environmental work. I'm active in, the, in C50 Maine in our Bangor chapter. Um, there's a new chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby in Bangor, which is how I've, I've been become interested in the um, <clears throat> in revenue neutral carbon tax or fee and other various activities. Okay, um, here's basically a basic outline. Again, we'll, we'll be looking at um, the U.S. labor movement and public policy, why unions are important in the formation of policy, and for a lot of you that's probably kind of obvious, uh, the importance of labor support and alliances for policies like big and the carbon tax, uh, to, to social dividends, and um, particularly I want to look at what, what the kinds of obstacles that labor faces in their terms of their own existence and survival and, and why that can pose difficulties or obstacles for people who are well-meaning, who want to get labor to jump on board on the latest policy and why that's not always easily done. Um, 
then looking briefly at why unions might support those two policies, looking at navigating the labor landscape for advocates and allies, and I'll be drawing very heavily from the Labor Network for Sustainability, which is a, f a phenomenal resource, and um, so I'm borrowing extensively from them for that, and um, take off from there. Okay. Uh, basically, so organized labor, despite challenges and various limitations, is still an important player in the United States, and in terms of um, both state and federal public policies. And as I, the NPR report recently stated, unions remain a major player in American politics, pouring money and manpower into elections and other public policy debates. And these are some examples of the kinds of activities that unions do. I'm sure some of you have done these kinds of things. I'm assuming that some of you are members of unions. How many are members of a union? Okay. Yeah, I'm a member of uh, MEA, which is the main education association. So, so there's very th different, different kinds of activities that unions do in policy, in terms of lobbying and so on. Um, it's good to know, first of all, that the two there are two major national international labor federations in the United States, the AFL-CIO, obviously, and also Change to Win, which, which is kind of a rebellious offshoot from the AFL-CIO. And, um, and before that, there was, I think, the New Voice Movement. And so the, the Change to Win Federation right now is very small. I believe it only has three unions right now. Um, the Teamsters, the SEIU, and I, and I think the um, United Farm Workers, and maybe the Carpenters. I forget if they're still there or not. And there were a couple other unions that belonged with them for a while and then later um, left again. But both of these federations work on a wide range of policy. Um, I do want to hold up this very excellent resource for anyone who's not familiar with it, who wants to know more about unions and the labor movement in the United States. What why Unions Matter, Michael Yates, and he, had, he talks everything about the politics of unions, uh, why the two-party system has not been very good to unions, uh, a bit of labor history and uh, strategy, policy, uh, everything you wanted to know about unions and were afraid to ask. Okay. Um, there's a number of policy issues that the EFL is concerned with. You can go to the website and look at what they are, so I'm not going to spend time right now obsessing on those, but you might notice that um, uh, a, a re revenue neutral carbon tax is not on that list. So, Okay, um, nor is a basic income guarantee. Um, okay, one thing that people should know if they're interested in trying to work with unions is some of the, uh, is some of the difficulties that unions face just in their very existence and having not very much resources, being short on staff, being under pressure or under attack from um, state policies. Um, so a lot of the union policy work at the state level was often defensive in the, in the face of anti-union attacks. Uh, for example, Michigan passed a right to work law in 2012. I'm not sure what the latest is from Wisconsin in terms of pa pass passing or ramming through a right to work bill. Uh, the last I knew, the Senate had passed it in Wisconsin. It was being sent to the Assembly. Scott Walker will certainly sign that bill. And for those who aren't familiar with right to work, look it up. Um, the, the, Uni the United States idea of right to work is, is a complete bastardization of the concept. It doesn't mean you have a right to a job. It means you have a right to work for less, as the unions say. So. Yeah, very different than English. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, so two social dividends, both the basic in income guarantee and the revenue neutral carbon tax are two different kinds of social dividends. Um, I won't go into detail on, on what a big or UBI is since everyone here can recite that in their sleep at this point. Um, the carbon tax and dividend um, or revenue neutral carbon tax is a proposal from that's been bandied about by various people, but that this particular version of it is from the Citizens Climate Lobby, which is an extremely focused and well-organized um, national organization which focuses specifically on trying to lobby in Congress with members of Congress to pass a revenue neutral carbon tax in which all the, the, the level of a tax or fee 
would go up by a certain amount every year in a predictable way, at least in principle. Um, and, and the entire amount from the, from the revenue would go back to citizens directly in the form of a dividend, of an annual or monthly dividend. And so the, the idea behind that is to slowly raise the price of carbon, to, um, which would provide a market incentive for the adoption of alternative energies and to help reduce carbon consumption, to reduce CO2 emissions. And, the, and people and the population, for, for most people, the benefit from the, the um, dividend would offset the higher cost of carbon. So that's the general idea. Um, and, the, and unions and labor is going to be, they're going to be critical players in both of these policies. Okay. Now, this is going to be probably not easy to see, but I, I actually have a one-page handout that at some point I can email to people if they'd like, in which I try to compare um, a basic income guarantee and revenue neutral carbon tax. They have, some, they have different, different goals. Um, the revenue neutral carbon tax is not nearly as large as a basic income guarantee would be. And so on. And one of my general interests is whether a basic income guarantee and a revenue neutral carbon tax can serve as a bridge to the other one. Um, and my, my personal belief is that it's probably more likely that we'll get a revenue neutral, a revenue neutral carbon tax before, before getting a basic income guarantee. And one of the interesting things is that the revenue neutral carbon tax is being supported on both sides of the aisle in terms of the political spectrum, kind of similar to how the basic income guarantee is of interest from the left to, you know, and left libertarians and to the right. And the, in the same way that a revenue neutral carbon tax has, attra has attracted the interest of people who are, um, who are more conservative, but they like it because it uses a market mechanism to reduce CO2 emissions. And in fact, the two, w the two people who basically co-founded and, and have gotten our fired up our local chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby are both moderate Republicans. So that's been very interesting to see. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm not going to obsess, like I said, on looking at these various um, dimensions of these two policies, except to say that I will gladly, I, I'll post this and yeah, I'll be glad to email to people as well. So, okay, um, just some quick historical context about the U.S. labor movement, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in labor history, but the overall theme, and um, Yates talks about this also, is that in contrast to a lot of, uh, to the labor unions in many other um, industrialized countries, um, labor unions in the U.S. has faced an exceptionally hostile political, economic, and legal environment basically for most of its history. And they are, and unions are still under, under uh, attack. And, and, and uh, you can see that with the struggles right now with the right to work at the state level, which is I think where the battles are happening right now. Um, there's been a widespread, one thing that people might, be, might need to know also is that it, for the most part, and I, the idea of of business unionism in which unions are basically exist to kind of service their members to focus on wages, hours, and working conditions, and just to focus, have a narrow focus like that. Um, that's been the, the dominant model within American unionism within the last few decades. That was not true of, of um, say, the Knights of Labor <coughs> or the IWW before that, but um, that's come to be the predominant approach, although it is being challenged by a number of unions, for example, the unions in, change, in the Change to Win Federation are, are challenging, and many critics have challenged that business unionism model of unions. Um, okay, and in contrast to most industrialized or OECD countries, uh, labor has never established its own labor party. I mean, there is something called the Labor Party, which I think got got founded, was founded, I think, in 96 or something, but it, we don't have anything like a, a national, powerful labor party like many, like probably most other industrialized countries do. Um, okay. Um, just a couple of highlights here from a bit of historical context. Globalization has been, um, been very damaging to labor and to the, and to the industrial base. 
Um, increasing, the increasing use of permanent replacement workers to break strikes has become more common, especially since the, uh, the PATCO strike, the, the, the uh, air controller strike in 1981, in which Reagan basically broke the union by bringing in permanent replacement workers. Um, and more recently, the, uh, various shock, I like to think of them as shock and awe, anti-labor policies at the state level, which are intended to drown the public sector in the bathtub and to drown unions in the bathtub, for that matter, with the help of, of Alex, uh, ALEC, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council. I'll go back to that for a second. Um, this is more at the bottom here. Um, <coughs> ALEC, the, the American Legislative Exchange Council, that is driving much of the state of the legislation at the state level, which is meant to disempower unions. Okay. Okay. Um, have unions shown a great deal of interest in basic income guarantees in the United States? Not that I can see. I just, it doesn't just seem to be on the horizon. That, be, um, that being said, um, some of the, the presentations people have done here um, on, on um, incremental development of policies that might lead to that, now that might be a different story. So that's worthy of a lot of attention. Um, I, wow, okay. Um, okay, so the basic reason why unions might support a basic income grant, grant has to do with economic insecurity. And there are a lot of forms of insecurity facing the labor movement. Again, it's useful for people to know who want to build alliances with them. Um, you can see by these figures that in, 20, in 2014, for the labor force as a whole in the U.S., only 11.1 percent of people were unionized in the U.S. And if you're not familiar with unions in the U.S., that's a really shocking figure. Um, the growth in unions over the past few decades has been in the public sector, and the shrinkage has been in the private sector. And this next graph shows that, and some of you have probably seen this. But this is a staggering chart that shows I think there was some federal, federal legislation passed in the early 1960s which allowed for unionization and collective bargaining in the public sector, which is why you see that sudden upsurge in public sector unions. But on the other hand, you see the gradual decline in private sector unions. So you can see why unions are in trouble. Um, yeah, it's a, and so you can see, again, if you're, if you're trying to build an, an alliance to develop policy with a private sector union, they are on the skits. I mean, they are struggling for their very survival. And so you can see why um, kind of academic ideas that might seem real to us might seem like, some, like, you know, we just can't deal with that right now. Ask us 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Um, okay, there's ongoing insecurity, um, which I won't go into, but you just look at a newspaper in terms of uh, job losses and so on. Workers workers are, un are losing unionized jobs. And one example of that is what happened in Bucksport, Maine, which is just down the river from Bangor. Um, the Versal paper mill there just shut down this, this past December, which represents a loss of jobs with good pay and also a loss of community. And I, and I see that as basically workers being booted out from the proletariat or traditional working class, they face being booted out into the precariat, and it depends upon what kind of jobs they'll end up finding, but there are not a lot of well-paying jobs in Maine, similar to that, and here are just a couple of pictures from uh, the closing. This was the last day, the last shift at the, at the paper mills that was shutting down. Um, th this is very, very serious for people, and a lot of people don't know how they're going to survive. I mean, they may find themselves at Walmart or other jobs, and so you can see the look on their faces. Uh, so th this is why I think there may be some um, interest in a basic income guarantee ultimately. Just very briefly, there, I'm just going to list uh, very quickly things that people ought to know about unions before you want to work with them. And again, these are, most of this is from the Labor Network from Sustainability and also from Michael Yates. First of all, unions are extremely diverse in terms of industries and occupations, their strategies and goals, their politics. Some of them are very, are very radical, some are very conservative. 
Um, secondly, their primary focus tends to be on short-term immediate issues of jobs and employment, and you can see why that's so, especially because there is no such thing as a basic income guarantee. Um, so it's, they tend to be a short-term focus and on immediate issues. They just don't have the resources or staff um, to deal with things that are more kind of theoretical for them or longer term. Thirdly, and this is really critical environment stuff, um, excuse me, okay, that labor unions generally support the industries in which their members work, which is understandable, but in, this is, gets complicated for climate change issues and also for other issues because you might not like the industry that, <laughs> you know, if you're an environmentalist, you might not be too fond of, say, um, coal mining and for good reason. But the coal miners are one example of a group which stands, which are extremely vulnerable to climate mitigation policies. And what, what the Labor Network for Sustainability wants to do is help work with unions and allies to try to push for legislation and protections for, un for people, workers and communities that stand to be impacted by um, climate change mitigation and so on. Um, lastly, a couple more things. There's often a contradiction between specific interests of particular unions versus the labor federations. Um, <laughs> this last thing is really important, number five, that the national and often local unions tend to be quite independent of each other <coughs> and have their own autonomy. Um, the AFL-CIO cannot tell its member unions what to do. I think there are like 57 member unions, the AFL-CIO. The CIO, the AFL-CIO is, is a loosely organized federation of basically independent unions. So you can't go to the AFL-CIO and say, okay, go tell your member unions what to do about climate change or basic income guarantees. You have to make linkages with and build relationships with local and national unions in various industries um, and occupations. That gets very complicated. Um, okay, um, last Okay, my very last point here is that there's a strong cultural tradition of solidarity in the union movement. A lot of environmental people, especially if you're middle-class academics, you're not used to the culture of unions, and that can be, an, that can be um, a stumbling block if you don't know what uh, solidarity is. Um, am I out of time? Yeah. Okay. So... If you want to see these things at some point, I, I've drawn off this table. I can send this to you folks, too, that shows the, the differences amongst some of the different uh, public sectors of unionism in terms of how, how vulnerable they are to climate mitigation and so on. And those, those tend to be the manufacturing and production unions, particularly in energy extraction. So, you'll, so basically, let me just scroll through the sectors here. Um, Ex the extraction and building trades tend to be kind of most conservative in terms of climate stuff. Um, building and construction also tend to be relatively con conservative in terms of, of, of environmental work. Um, and again, you can see this table. I'll send any of these. I'll send this to people if you want to see it. That the these more cons the unions that are most impacted in their industries by climate mitigation, they're going to support the Keystone XL. They're not going to be crazy about cutting CO2 emissions, although everyone tends to support green jobs, but what green jobs are varies widely in terms of who, you know, what you mean by that. Um, manufacturing, and then government and the public sector are going to be most supportive of climate change stuff. They're least impacted by it as well, so that makes sense. Okay, so um, and to just leave you with then, um, one, thing that, one, th one overbearing strategy and goal is to have a just transition for, for unions and workers and industries impacted by climate change. And I think a basic income guarantee can play a critical role in that. Okay. okay thanks, yeah. Thank okay, as I mentioned, I'll just take, I think I'm doing about two minutes, just read this extended abstract of uh, Roy Morrison's paper. It's entitled The Big and the B, B-E-E, -E -E, uh, sustainable convergence. The essential question is whether a global capitalist market system can be domesticated and transformed to act in a fashion to combine goals of economic growth and profit along with ecological improvement and social justice. 
is the only choice for a sustainable future to abolish corporate capitalism and start again? This paper uh, addresses a basic income grant, BIG Big, and a basic energy entitlement, BEEB, as tools for building an ecological future with a radically reformed market system. The rise of an ecological world system means fundamental change in the conduct of the global market. In an ecological civilization, economic growth will come to mean ecological improvement and the creation of sustainable wealth and regeneration of natural capital. A fully functional ecolo ecological market system will rest on the equilibrium between economic growth, profit, and natural capital. The working capital account and the natural capital account but must be kept in healthy, dynamic balance and must uh, reach towards an equilibrium state. A big and the B to be discussed here are part of new market rules, laws, and regulations to support our ecological transition. A global plan for a B as a complement to a big uses assessments on all energy use on a kilowatt per hour equivalent basis. The B is a concrete means for transferring capital from high energy users to low energy users, from rich to poor, uh, both between and within nations. B assessments levied at the point of consumption on all energy used in terms of kilowatt hour equivalent is a fair means to help fund a global renewable energy fund. The B assessment will be proportional to energy use with large industrial and commercial users paying much larger fees. The big and the B would more than rebate B payments made by the poor to both rich and poor nations. A B is a practical concrete proposal to help catalyze the building of a global ecological civilization. Okay, that's the abstract of the course the papers on the website if people want to delve into um, Roy's paper in, in more depth. Okay, well, we've had two uh, very different, but two very interesting uh, presentations here, so I'll open the uh, floor for uh, comments. Are, is anything on the, uh, the web yet, Scott? Um, okay, in the meantime, I'll, Jason said, and oh, I want to make sure everybody, like, I'm, I'm not going to take uh, more than uh, one question from the particular person until everybody has a chance, so I'll start with Jason and Sid, and then, sorry, I don't know your name. Christine. Sorry? Christine. Christine, okay. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, sorry, we've got like 10 minutes, so I'll ask you to keep everybody to please keep the, the points. Uh, I'll try to be quick. I have one question each. I get a lot of pushback on your Facebook page. Um, there seems a strong intuition that it'll help art for the reasons you presented. Very strong intuition uh, that it'll produce lots of bad art. It's almost like the couch potatoes will make art and will sort of be flooded by bad art. It just seems a lot of people are generating very different of what will happen to art with basic income. Yeah, but we already have a lot of bad art. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Is it, we're not really going to change that. I mean, yeah, just like Furious 7 is coming out. Who expects that to be yeah, good? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, we, we've had bad art forever. Yeah. It's just, it, it's just now we can just have more choice about what kind of art. We don't need to have, we don't need to have Sony Pictures telling us like, oh, go see this terrible movie because, you know, we're going to release one out of 50 movies that's going to be great. I mean, we've all, we've all had important, like, profound experiences seeing a commercially made movie or hearing a commercially made song. But we just don't need to, you know, centralize the control in these different sources now. So, no, we're not going to get rid of bad art. And there's going to be way more of it. And there's going to be a lot of mediocre art, just like there's always been. But we just, there'll be a diverse, a diverse production source now because the technology's here for people to do, but we just can't take advantage of it because we can't encourage people to invest the time to actually make it better. It's solid. <laughs> Valerie, uh, can we use, I'm trying to think of a rap here, if I'm saying to someone to, in the union movement, Van Hollen has a bill, here's what it does, right? If we don't back it and put it in, can we use other basic income proposals as threats? Like, in other words, if you don't get it, Paul Ryan might come up with one. In other words, get in on this now, something that actually delivers a bit for us, solves the problem, because we may be seeing ones that don't have a dividend, right? Like a cap and trade, right? I mean, there's other proposals out there, and we need you to pick this one because it delivers more, you know, does that sound good or help me out? Well, I'm not sure if I can answer that. 
I'm the right person to ask them, because um, I'm not a spokesperson, obviously, but I mean, I think it, on the one hand, it can't hurt to share that. Um, on the other hand, I think if people's plates are so full, they can't really deal with anything that far reaching or in people's perceptions unlikely, they might, I, I, sus I suspect the reaction you might get as well, you know, that's, that's too bad. I hope it doesn't happen, but that we just can't take that on right now. Well, but, yeah. there, but there may be specific yeah, people. But that being said, I mean, there's a lot of variation within the movement in terms of people's opinions and beliefs. I mean, it's not by any means homogeneous. So you might, even if a, if a union doesn't take an official position on something like that, you may find individuals who are willing to work on those within the movement. So that's part of the critical piece is finding people and groups to work with. Okay, Sid. I'm like Jason, I'll only ask one question. But um, I've heard, Valerie, two uh, kinds of primary objections from unions to a big one from public sector unions, and, and Jurgen talked about this yesterday, yeah. really, saying the transfer from administrative cost to benefit you're talking about will cost us jobs. Mm -hmm. The second objection I've heard uh, is look, uh, manufacturing is get, is getting more and more hollowed out. We need something more targeted. We need something aimed. We don't need a big for everyone. We need those resources concentrated, for example, in support for older workers who are not likely to be reemployed when uh, you know when the hollowing out advances. H how would you deal with those objections? Um. I, I think I would ask the, some of the people who presented yesterday about about working on incremental policies that would eventually lead over time to a basic income guarantee, which is one reason why some of those presentations I found so interesting yesterday over the past couple of days of the, of the concept of you know what policies might we work on that might be a foundation to to over time develop into a, a wider basic income guarantee. And so I think you could probably get more interest in some specifics like that. But um, I mean, there there is some there are some protections already for for manufacturing um, plants that have been shut down because of, of uh, global trade, and I forget what it's, what it's called a trade impact or something. But there there is some funding for that, like there was another paper mill, Eastern Fine Paper, that shut down in Bangor about eight or 10 years ago, and Mike and I have a friend who used to work there who got some funding like to take some courses and so on. It's, it's pretty pathetic and limited, but um, yeah, I mean, I think there does need to be thought about about targeted programs as well, but I don't think that would that would be instead of a basic income guarantee. But, yeah, yeah, it's an issue. The bug is that, of course, we see uh, neoliberal approaches to limiting size of the state and state expenditures. So yes, that's there is a trade-off whether we like it or not, I think. We're on the ground and scared in northern Minnesota. And the unions uh, were against sulfide mining. XL is coming through us. Uh, the uh, other pipelines are coming from Bakken, threatening through us, Enbridge. Um, and the unions, of course, are for all this. Because short-term jobs and and it's, it's right in our faces. So and I, uh, I'm a friend with the others supported by unions in the past uh, uh, election and um, not in the, currently I ran last year, I wasn't supported. But um, how to really engage, you know, it's like, I, yeah, I gotta sit down with the, the former head of Central Labor Body, we have to have coffee. Yeah, and the, I, I just became an IWW member and the young people in, in Minnesota are, are organizing, and uh, so I'm the old, old, old person in that group. <laughs> I think they're a suspect of me. They finally gave me my little red card with, with the stamps in it. Um, and so I told them about this, and I will bring that back to them. And, you know, you need to get all oh, these unions. I know the IWW will be there uh, in some way, shape, or form. I don't know about the FLCIO. <laughs> Teachers Union, I teach. Um, uh, stick in the mud, stick in the mud, people. I'm, you know. <laughs> well, oh God. I, I, I will be diplomatic and just say that they, they're they're focused on 
kind of fairly narrowly on certain issues. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And one last thing, uh, paper mills, we just had Georgia Pacific Koch Brothers uh, shut down in Duluth, and the workers wanted to buy it, and I believe they were unionized, they wanted to buy it. And of course, Coke wouldn't sell it to them because it would uh, be in competition with Coke. So, yeah. yeah. So that's, that apparently played a role in this most recent shutdown in Bucksport, too, because the company, Verso, which had owned that mill, and it's gone through different owners over the years, also owned a non-union paper mill in Jay. I think they own the Jay paper mill now. There was a very famous labor circles uh, strike in uh, Jay, Maine, uh, back in the late 80s. <coughs> so that's, that is still non-union. That strike was broken by, um, by the paper mill company, by international paper, with replacement workers, among other things. Okay, I've got Felix on the list in the room here. Scott, is there anything from the web? Felix, this may be the last oh, question no. within our <coughs> time on the kid. I'd like oh, to. Oh, sorry, we, we do have one. Okay, we'll take that and then we'll go to you. <coughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, you, this is for Carter. You talked about big in relation to RNCT and big in relation to labor unions. But could you talk a bit about RNCT in relation to labor unions? Why, why or why not might an, an RNCT specifically? be important to labor unions and their members, other than how it impacts their specific industries? Um, that, that's a good question. I, um, I, I don't have a clear answer to that, but I think it might be a useful tool to help unions start thinking about the idea of getting a social dividend. About that. I mean, union members would benefit as much as anybody else in terms of getting um, getting that dividend every year and so it's going to help it's going to help um, deal with climate change and so on in ways that benefits union members as well as non-union members so my hope is that that if a revenue neutral carbon tax gets is more likely to get passed say within the next few years that it will it will be kind of a a stepping stone for unions to start thinking about well what other kinds of, of social dividends might be possible. Okay, Felix. Um, I just want to add some comments. And the first one is, uh, you said uh, the right to work. But we have to rethink the whole concept. Unions never fought for the right to work. They fought for the, uh, for, they fought for the right to income. So, and once we, we can change this narrative, maybe then, uh, you, you know, I tried to contact unions in Germany. I, I'm doing it for 10 years. They are rejecting completely because they, it's look, it looks like they are thinking to be uh, obsolete once the BIC is installed, which I uh, don't believe in because uh, you, w you still will have a need for unions to, to have, you know, the, the working conditions, but not the, in the income issue once you install that. And it would be benefit the unions because you don't need to ask for uh, member fees to fill in your strike uh, uh, treasure because you already have the income you need, the monthly income. So everybody can, if, if you're going to go on strike, the people <coughs> will have the money to do so, which, you know, it's a benefit for both. But in Germany, the unions just don't, don't see that. And they really, do it. it's not only objection, it's really rejection. Are they, are they talking about right to work in the American sense, though? Probably not. I mean, the, the, the American right to work laws have to do with whether or not um, unions and employers can negotiate. It's, it's called a union security clause. And the union security clause basically requires that people who are not members of the union have to pay some kind, have to pay a representation fee. So they, and so the, so the right wing basically s s uh, describes that as forced union membership, saying that um, in, in, uh, in states that don't have right to work laws, it's, you can be required, if, if you're in a union which negotiates this as part of their contract, to, to pay a, uh, a partial fee to the union for the cost of being represented and, and having, having your contract um, be bargained and so on. Um, so in right-to-work states, um, it's, it's illegal 
to, to require someone, a non-union member, to pay that representation fee. So it's basically a, w a way of disempowering unions by um, reducing their finances, basically. So it's, it's, I think, so it's a different concept in the American context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, it's I think... Still, it's still in general. I just want to point out, and that's, yeah. that may be some worldwide issue, right. if unions once rethink that they are not fighting for work, they're fighting for income. That's mm -hmm. very important. I think and just I, the I last agree. remark... Yeah, I agree. Okay, we're, we are out of time now. We have to find out. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can talk to Valerie okay. or Jude after. Okay, yeah, we're, we're two minutes past the time limit, so we're going to have to wind up and get ready for the next session. So just please join me in, in welcoming uh, both, both Valerie and Jude for their interesting presentation. <laughs>